Father, to God be the glory. Great things you have done. So love you, I, everyone. Lord, you loved us all that you gave your beloved and glorious son. We come into your presence this morning. We know that you are God. We know that you are miracle working. We know that, Lord, you created this earth. You formed dust and gave man the very breath of life. No one else can do that. You are the one. You're the one that through the generations and generations of sinner on top of sinner, still you never gave up. You extended grace. You worked your plan. And Lord, you sent your son, your only beloved son, for God so loved the world that he gave. And Lord, you gave that we today could have eternal and blessed life. Thank you for that gift of Jesus and thank you for that blood that washes away our sins. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today and may you be magnified and glorified and exalted in this place. We've come to worship Jesus, not to talk about politics, not to talk about the weather, not to talk about everybody and anybody, but we're here to talk about the one, the only one that can change lives, that can bring blessings, that can save sinners, that can heal diseases, that can do all things exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that power is Jesus that works in us today. And we honor you today and we glorify your name. We exalt you with all praise. We give thanks in all things. We declare that you are God. And we declare that you are good. Yes, Lord, all the praise. All the praise goes to Jesus. All the praise to him alone. All the glory and honor forevermore. All the praise to him alone. All the praise goes to Jesus. All the praise to him alone. All the glory and honor forevermore. All the praise, it goes to Jesus alone. Thank you, Lord. We have that promise of your presence and your goodness and your blessings. May you pour out your spirit upon us today. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, it's in the blessed name. The name of Jesus. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Secure from all alarms, leading Jesus, leading we're leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Secure from all alarm, leading Jesus, Christ my Savior, leading on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leading on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Go sing. Leaning on Jesus. Christ my Savior. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus. Christ my Savior. Leaning on the everlasting arms. We're leaning.
leading, yes, we're leading, Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms, leading, Jesus, leading, on the everlasting arms. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 5. We'll be picking up and reading verses 1 through 20. I'm talking about the all-victorious Jesus. And he is victorious. You may be having struggles going on in your life. You may be having difficulty, pains and decisions, problems and grief. But I want to assure you that in the midst of all of that, there is a Jesus who is bigger and greater and who can turn your situations around. Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, we're going through the gospel of Mark and learning what it is to follow Jesus. And we can follow him regardless of the culture in which we live in today that turns its face away from Christianity and following Christ. I want you to know today we can remain as steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, saints of God who are called to do his work. During the Second World War, when Hitler had conquered or was conquering France, Hitler shut down the borders to keep the people from leaving the country. But one small border town saw its population diminish rapidly, so the Germans searched for the answer. It turned out that this town had a cemetery and it's really uh, straddled along the border of a neighboring country which was not free from the Nazi control. The locals opened up an, an, an ancient gate in the wall of the cemetery. And they kept having funerals, except the people never came back. They went out to the tombs, but they just kept walking right on through that gate to their freedom. You know, I use that illustration because the picture here that we see today in our text is in a cemetery. We many times see cemeteries as finality, but it really is not. For some it is. Because they didn't accept Christ, they died in their sin, and they went to hell. But for the Christian, the cemetery is not the finality from the standpoint to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Today our next story is a story of a man who found freedom in the cemetery of the Azarene demonic. There was a man there. He was demon possessed. He was filled with sin. He served Satan. He was a maniac. And we see this man who was bound by the power of Satan, but found freedom, even among the tombs, by the power of Jesus. Oh, I'm glad today. There's power in that name. There's power in the presence. And there's power in the blood. The church never should lose its sight of the blood of Jesus Christ. For in that blood is our freedom. In that blood is our deliverance. In our blood, or in his blood today, is our salvation. So after he met Jesus, the man was changed. And this was indeed his story. My question from you today is, what does your story look like? Is your story still that you're bound in sin? Is your story you're still living in? in the pains of sorrow and suffering? Is your story is the fact that you just feel overwhelmed? I'm telling you one of the greatest things that's happening in the church of America today and also happening in the culture in which we live in, it's a thing called depression. I've never seen more depressed people. I picked up my phone this morning. I thumbed through to just see comments that people were making on Facebook. It was saturated with depression, defeat, 
agony, difficulty, pain, sorrow. Not much mention of the one who is the cure for all of that. I'm telling you today, yesterday, I was in the memorial service, had a very busy day. I was on the phone a lot. But you know, I had people calling me that were going through times of difficulty. And I prayed with them. And I want you to know, God can turn your situation around. Amen. You do not have to live in depression. I don't care how insurmountable the issues that you're facing are. I don't care how big the problems are that you're going through that has consumed you. Our God is a God that can turn things around in your life. For he is victorious. And as the word of God declares, there's nothing too hard for God. Come and turn in your Bibles to Mark 5. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can just listen to me. I'm picking you up with verse 20. got a long text today, but that's okay. Does that mean you're going to have a short message? We'll see. (laughs) And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. That's how strong he was. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him. And the fetters broke in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And, all, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran This is a kind of an ironic verse here. He ran and worshiped him. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him saying, Send us unto the swine that we may enter unto them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out, went out of the man, and entered into the swine. And the herd, next time you sit down with a big piece of pork, think about that. That big barbecue sandwich you're going to eat today, think about that. That big piece of. Uh, pork chop, a ham you're going to devour today. You think about that. (laughs) Entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea for there were about 2,000. This man was possessed and all the demons went into 2,000 pigs. You say, preacher, that's, that's unbelievable. All with God, all things are possible. And were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled. I tell you what, I guess their eyes were probably as big as saucers. They had never seen anything like that. And told it in the city and in the country. And they that went out to see what it was there, uh, to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid and they that and they said and they that said and they that saw it told them how 
it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray. Pray him to depart out of that coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it? Jesus suffering him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and that had compassion. Underscore that word in your spirit and had compassion on him. We, the church of Jesus, are to be compassionate people. Amen. Through my years of ministry, I've sought to be a compassionate person. But last year, God took my compassion to another level. God intensified my compassion for the suffering, the hurting, and those who are going through the trials of life. We, the church, need to have compassion on people. We need to have compassion on the lost. We have need to have compassion on those who have drifted. We need to have compassion on those who are chasing the sinful plights of moral degradation in our world today. We're not here to condemn, but we're not here to condone. But we are here to have compassion and pray that people would come to Christ and know him as their Savior. And what better banner to proclaim that than your life in mine today. Compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in the capitalists how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Marvel. Astonished. Overwhelmed. Shocked at what Jesus had done. A man who wrote most of the New Testament. His name was the Apostle Paul. Prior to that he was Saul of Tarsus. A persecutor of the church. A man who sat on the council that had many put to death. The Sanhedrin court. But we find this man wrote to many churches. Philippi. Colossus. Ephesus. And he wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said this in verse 6 of chapter 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put all the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The forces of evil are not only found in, in the atmosphere of heavenly places, but also they are found here on earth also. We're living in an evil time. We're living in a time where people have no regard for God, the church, his house, for his people, for anything that pertains to him, his word, holy living. This world is spinning in total, complete rebellion against God, against holiness. And they are embracing the horrible sins of this world. I'm not going to name all those sins. You know them well. You know the situations that we're facing. You know today this world is not as it used to be. But see, sin began in the Garden of Eden. And sin has been on a rampage ever since. Destroying lives. Wrecking homes. And driving souls into hell. But we see that here the forces of evil have invaded the lives of many people. This passage really opens it up to us about the evil that has invaded our land and our communities and our families and our lives. It was after a stormy night on the Sea of Galilee that Jesus had rebuked the storm. Remember as I preached last Sunday and how the disciples came to him in the hull of the ship and they said, Bat Master, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves and the storm and simply said, peace be still. Listen, 
they had been through that and now they find themselves the boat is easing up on the shore it wasn't destroyed you know in the presence of God there's not destruction amen, amen. he's a life changer he today can turn your life around. Whatever you're in, going through, I want you to know there's a Jesus today who is victorious. As he hung there on the cross and he defeated sin, Satan, and everything else that this world could offer, there our Christ, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, won the victory for us. Amen. This passage shows us the power of and the authority Jesus has over even the supernatural events that are happening in this world. In this passage, Jesus invades. Jesus in this passage invades and we find that he does, he does what not has been done in thousands of years. They had never seen anything on this fashion Satan and his fallen angels had had free reign, destroying lives, wreaking havoc on this earth. And up to this day, right here in this text, things change. On this day, when the boat sailed up to the shore, everything would change for the powers of evil. I want you to know today, Satan may be appearing to have a heyday in our world today. We may be concerned and seemingly that he is winning. We see the sin that has bombarded our society, has destroyed lives through drugs, through alcohol, through perverse sex, through seeking to change gender, through changing their lives to change their lives to an immoral way. But I want you to know today, our God is not defeated. For sitting on the throne of heaven today is the victorious Christ who hung on a cross. And on the third day, after he'd been placed in the tomb, he arose victorious. He ascended. He's not defeated. And if you're a child of God, I don't care how bad this world may appear, you and I are not defeated. We are children of the most high God. This passage is here to encourage you and I that there's victory in Jesus. This passage is also here to remind you of the real dangers of evil. I'm telling you the word of God and Satan, yes, he does go as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may seek to devour you, destroy you, to hurt you, to really annihilate you and your family and your life. Demon possession is a real thing. And if you don't believe it, look at our world today and see what we're facing. Anywhere you find the destruction of God's good creation, especially in people, for listen, we are not here by accident. For the word of God declares we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. We did not evolve. We were not the result of an explosion. Amen. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us. And he didn't make you for defeat. He made you for deliverance. He didn't make you to live in defeat and discouragement all your life. He made you to live in victory. Amen. See, if you're living in defeat, you know I mentioned a moment ago about this issue of depression and has consuming lives and ripping the very heart out of people and destroying them and even causing people to be suicidal. Let me tell you what. This Jesus didn't make you for that. He made you today to be an overcomer. And the only way that you can overcome is coming over to him and giving your life to him. Amen. And trusting him and serving him and loving him. And knowing today, whatever you face in life, and you may feel like I'm down, defeated, I don't know what to do. You can call on this one who is called Jesus the Christ. Amen. Yeshua, our Lord, Adonai, our God, Jehovah. 
He today can do all things and meet all needs in your life. But don't miss the lesson of the life that he's trying to teach you. God had to put me on my back. I was basically hospitalized for almost three months. I was dead, in essence, clinically, medically. I was not supposed to be alive today. But by the grace of the God that formed me and made me and gave me the very breath that's in my body that lifted me up off of the bed of affliction, that restored me and gave me artificial limbs that I could walk and stand before you today and to proclaim the name of God Amen. and to tell you today that even whatever you're facing and going through, it's not the time to quit. And I've said this before. Some of you have felt like in life, you felt like giving up. You've got to stay in the ring. You've got to be a champion for Christ. You've got to keep the gloves on. We are in a fight, but we're not in a fight that we're going to lose. We're in a fight that's already been won. And even if you get knocked down, God will lift you back up. He will wipe the sweat, the blood, and the tears off of your face. He will give you the endurance to fight the good fight of faith. Not to give up. Keep the gloves on. Jab, punch, look to Jesus. And in the end, there's coming a day when the final round and the bell will ring. And you will stand before the very throne of God with your hand raised in victory. Amen. For you have trusted the King of kings and the Lord of lords and nothing in this world. Whatever Satan today has formed and disguised to bring to your life to defeat you, let me tell you what, in all these things today, we are champions. Amen. Whatever Satan today has manipulated against you, Isaiah said of God, it shall not prosper. You say, I'm, I'm going through the valley. Oh, you'll go through the valley, but you'll get out of it. Amen. Hallelujah. I came out of the valley. I, I came out of the wilderness. And if God brought me out, hallelujah, he can bring you out. There's power in the blood. There's power in the name. There's power in his presence. There's power in his word. There's power in the God today that can lift you up. And there's a God today who will carry you over and bring you in. And you'll never live in defeat again. That's our God. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Yeah, everywhere you find the destruction of God's creation, but also you find today, and this is where he's working against people. You, you, can, you can guarantee Satan may be close by, but I'm going to tell you, when Jesus shows up, he has to leave. What words are you proclaiming in your life today? Words of, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to turn. I don't know what to do in these situations. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know. I'm facing this. I'm going through that. I've got this. I've got that. I've got infirmity in my body. What do I do? I'll tell you what you do. You say it in two words. God, help! Yeah. And he will. Every time I've cried out to the Lord, but his grace and mercy, he's always been there. Somebody needed that today. And I pray God will touch your life. I'm telling you today, when Jesus shows up, the devil has to surrender. Amen. He is already defeated. He's already defeated. He's still throwing those jabs. He gets knocked down. Let me tell you what. He's already been defeated at the cross. And you have victory in Jesus. I, I want you to find confidence in the healing, the saving 
and the cleansing power that is found in Jesus today. So my theme goes like this. It's kind of in a broad sense. Jesus is a victorious, transforming Savior. Amen. Amen. Jesus just didn't win victory. He transformed a man. And you know what? You're looking at a man, he's also transformed. I once was a sinner, the chief of sinners, as Paul said, but Jesus found me in my mess and pulled me out of the mire and set me upon a rock, forgave me of my sins, had mercy on my soul, saved me, and he's put praise in my life and he's given me a life today that will glorify him. Amen. Let me give you a few points. One, Jesus is stronger than your worst demons. This place has never been Jewish that Jesus found himself in there in the Gadarenes. When Jesus, it was basically Greek. But when Jesus stepped out of a boat... Here comes a demon-possessed man coming out of the cemetery. And this man is filled with demons. He's unclean. Jesus knew that. He knew before he even arrived on the land. He knew before anything that there would be this man. Because, see, he's fully God. Let's not under, underestimate Jesus. Fully man, but fully God. Knowing all things in his omniscience. So this man is filled with demons. This man, his life was tragic. He lived among the dead. They cannot bind him. And he had, had supernatural strength. He was strong. See, listen, that's what, that's what sin and Satan will do to you. It'll make you strong in your flesh. But you're dead in your spirit. Nobody had the strength to subdue this man. Mark paints a picture on this man's life and he says his life is tortured it's painful uh, his life is filled with shame and this is what sin does to us doesn't it not just this man because listen you say well man I've never been demon possessed oh yes you have been you're mighty quiet if you were lost and if you are lost you're demon possessed you have the spirit of Satan in you and the only action notice that will get him out of your life is the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 And you and I who are saved, we are in warfare every day against the demons that we face. No, they cannot live and dwell within us, but we fight against these things. We're in warfare. That's why I took a moment and told you, keep the gloves on and stay in the ring. Don't give up. Don't get knocked out. Don't throw in the white towel. Amen. They came by this guy, and, and you see that his life is such a mess. And he's so overwhelmed by sin. But also, there comes the power of the gospel that is found in Jesus. Mark sets it up Jesus is stronger than all your demons. Amen. I hear people mention about I'm facing demons. I got these demons. Let me tell you what I don't care what. Ever you're facing, what demon you're facing, Jesus is stronger because there's none likened unto his strength. And that's why he's given you today the admonition to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Secondly, Jesus is Lord. This is found in verse, verses 6 to 13. We see, we know, there's no doubt Jesus is victorious, but in verse 6, Something happens. He ran. This man ran to worship Jesus. Jesus has invaded the territory of the demons. The demons said, Jesus, you don't belong here. If you remember as we were reading, they told him to leave. The demons feared Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. For they knew what Jesus can do. Just think when you're in that trial of life and you feel so burdened and you're down so deep, just think if you would mention the name of Jesus. 
I mean, just don't think it, say it. Just to say his name. That name that is above every name. That name that gives victory. Just to shout out, Jesus! Demons flee! The devil is defeated. Their names. Their name was Legion, which means thousands. So thousands of demons are no match for the one Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the demons, they requested to be sent to the pigs by Jesus. This happened. 2,000 pigs went dashing down a hillside over a cliff into the sea and pigs don't swim. They drowned it. Picture the scene. 2,000 pigs with all four feet turned up towards the heavens, dead. Boy, you talking about a barbecue. Well, there's going to be no barbecue that day. Amen. What is the picture here, Pastor? I'm going to tell you what the picture is. This whole picture here, if you want it in a word, Jesus is displaying a word that is called dominance. And he possesses dominance. Whatever today is holding you, let me tell you what, Jesus can release you from that because he is dominance. When you speak the name of Jesus, demons flee. When you cry out for the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God, sins and if issues in your life has to depart. Why are you housing these things? Why are you entertaining its presence today? Jesus let those demons come out of the man. And let me tell you what, go into the pigs and it just shows you what evil can do. Evil is destructive. And evil will destroy your life if you don't have Christ. Jesus allowed this to happen so that there may be a tangible evidence and to show Satan's design for this is where sin will take you. Sin will take you to defeat. Oh, it's okay to sin a little bit. Preacher? No, it's not. It's okay if I go the way of the world during the week. No, it's not. When the word says to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that means you don't have a day off from Jesus. Thank you, Debbie. That's a good word. There's no wiggle room. Because when you get your eyes off of Jesus, you're destined to step out of the path of blessing. And I'm going to tell you today, you cannot tell me that you're a Christian and God will bless you when you live in like hell. When you're chasing the things of the world. Isn't it all right for Christians to snort a little bit? The only snorting you better do is when you're snoring. Amen. Is it all right if I smoke a joint once in a while? Really, you're hanging out in the wrong joints and it leads to your destruction. Is it all right to drink a blood light? Bud light. Is it all right if I have a Miller's or something like that? Miller Low Life? Because that's what all that mess takes you to, to a low life. What kind of testimony do you have for Christ? You know, I, I see, and I've got to tell you this, because it's really, it's really nagging at me. And when something nags at me, I've got to get a solution. I see people, I won't mention names specifically, but I'm going to tell you, it really nags me when I see people to proclaim the name of Jesus, put pictures on the Facebook page, do all of this, but then they show a picture and they're sitting there and they got one of those blue aluminum cans sitting on the table or they're someplace and they've got a little glass and you know what goes in it. It's a mixed drink and they're drinking. You tell me God's glorified in that. Come on, church. And then you put stuff on there, but then you're saying, oh, I'm going to a certain church Sunday. Well, bless God, I wish you'd go and get saved. 
Because I don't believe Christians act that way. You say, well, you old-fashioned, you old fuddy-duddy thing, you. Call me old, call me fuddy-duddy, call me anything you want to. But I tell you what, when Jesus calls, you can call me bye-bye and gone while you're standing there waving at me and I'm going up. Amen. I'm telling I'm not trying to be smart, Ali. I'm telling you today, Christians are dropping they're dropping their testimony and today we are being an embarrassment to the very throne room of almighty God by the way that we conduct our lives, the way that we talk, the way that we live. 13 year old girls getting on the internet and using language that is certainly unbecoming of a Christian. Four letter words that's not in my vocabulary. Come on people. What are we raising up? A generation of Heathens? It seems that way. We need to get back to the basis of God's word of holy, right, consecrated, dedicated, living. We need to get Jesus back in the pulpits of the churches today where we're preaching Christ and not ideology and some other gospel or some other means or some other way or something else or some motivational speech to make you feel good. We need Jesus back in the church. I'm telling you today, Jesus allows this to happen so that he can give the very evidence of the design that Satan has and that's to kill your life and to drag you into the very bowels of hell. And that's his purpose because that's his plight and that's his plan and that's his destination. But glory to God, it's not mine. Amen. And I pray it's not yours. This is all showing to me the value of hum humanity of a human being. Doesn't that, isn't that shown in God condescending in the presence of Jesus and coming down to this earth and dying for our sins on the cross? This is also a display of God's sovereignty because I don't care what's going on in this world and what's going on 200 miles north of here in Washington or any other place in the world. The fact is this, God is sovereign and you want the definition of sovereign? In control. God is in control and I don't care what's happening in this world. I don't understand why God's permitting these things. It's the generation that we're living in that is professed and proclaimed that will happen just before the coming of the the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. Don't look down and get defeated. Look up and rejoice Be your redemption is drawing nigh. Amen. Oh, there were thousands of demons. Two thousand demons and one Jesus. And it only took one Jesus to take down those demons. For at the command of Jesus, everything obeys. Listen, everything we have belongs to him. Your life belongs to him. You've been bought with a price. I caught a clip on my phone about the rallies that's going on and for abortion and against abortion. Let me tell you something, friend. God is the giver of life. God is the taker of life. And I don't care who you are, man, woman, doctor, or whoever, whoever or whatever, you have no right to take the life of a baby. Maybe if you'd behave yourself and live morally, maybe you wouldn't have that problem and you're just trying to find a way out of your sin. Thank God for ladies who have babies. Thank God for your precious baby. Amen. Thank God for the baby that's back here. Thank God for children. Thank God my mother and father didn't abort me. Some of you probably saying, I kind of wish they would, but no. No, no. I'm telling you today, it's wrong. And I'm not getting political, but I'm telling you biblically today that God is the giver, the sustainer of life, and we need to respect that. Amen. So that being the case, there were these pigs and the demons went into the pigs at the very command of Jesus and the obey was given. And also this, is, this exposes sin's end game. Where does your sin and where will your sin take you? I'm going to tell, tell you. It's going to take you to hell is where it's going to take you. It's going to destroy you. Two points. Um, three, four, and five are quick points. Two points. 
There's nothing to fear, one. And I'm trying to be poetic. There's nothing to fear if Jesus is near. So if your life is hidden in Christ, there's nothing to fear. See, that's another, that's another tool of Satan. Depression is all derived from fear. And God has not given you the spirit of fear. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. God has not given me the spirit of fear. Amen. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Second, good and evil are not equally matched. God and Satan are not equally matched. I wouldn't even use Satan's name in the same sentence with God except to say, Satan, you have been defeated by God. Amen. So the power of evil is no match against Jesus. Third, Jesus always gets a response. This is what really happens when Jesus gets a hold of your life. When you are saved, you are changed forever. I believe in the eternal security that God gives us in salvation. Amen. This demon-possessed man, you know what he found? He found peace. And he's clothed now. And he's in his right mind. See, sin will just make you absolutely bat crazy. And you may think you have your right mind, but you don't. You're not thinking right. It destroys your thinking, and that's the method of attack. That's why Paul said, put on the helmet of salvation. That's to protect your thinking. So the people became afraid when they saw the change. They had tried to change this man. They couldn't. They didn't have the power. The people begged Jesus then to depart. They were overwhelmed by what had occurred. And there are different responses to God's grace of Jesus. And so, how do you respond to the gospel of Jesus? How are you responding today? You know, I'm telling you, there's a God who loves you. You saw it on the screens when you came in. God loves you. How are you responding to that word and that love? Are you turning your head and your heart away from it? Or are you receiving it abundantly and calling upon it? How do you respond? Everyone has a response. Then forth, Jesus is what we need. He really is. Jesus is what we need. This man had been changed. And you know what he did? The crowds, those who are rejectors, they wanted Jesus to leave. But you know what? This man, he wanted Jesus to stay. He had been changed. He wanted to be near Jesus. He wanted to be close to Jesus. And if you've been saved and born again, you should want to be close to Jesus. You should not want to be close to the things of this world. You should want to look and, and today have the uh, attributes of the world attached to you. Isn't that the desire that salvation creates in us today? No, we're not perfect. But we want to be near Jesus because he's a life changer. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter how long your hair is. It doesn't matter what's on your skin. That has no pertinence to it. We judge, and I don't know why churches want to judge people by their outward appearance. Amen. By the way, neither you nor I are the judge nor the jury. Amen. I just want to see people come in and get saved and have their life changed. You know, I believe when you come to Christ, that desire of Christ, you can't get enough of Jesus. You want to be in His presence. You want that aroma of heaven on you in everything that you do. Desiring to be in the Lord's presence, you know what it reflects? Then it reflects your dependence that you have on the Lord. Desiring to be in His presence will strengthen you and bless you beyond measure. That's what it happens. That's the way it happens. That's what he does in our lives. King David said, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. When you taste of it, oh, it becomes so sweet in your life. It just becomes a part of you. Like putting on your clothes. 
It's just like, you know, you're wearing Jesus all the time. And you don't have to put him on because he's already on you. Woo! Amen. Fifth, Jesus is the mission. The mission. Jesus didn't permit this man to go with him. Hmm, why not? There, was, there are times in our lives that this sovereign God says no to our desires. Things that we think we want or want to do or be or whatever. And God says, nope. Nope. You know why? Because God's got a greater blessing for you. Because he has a specific mission for his life for this man as he has a specific mission for every one of you that are looking at me today. Jesus told the man to go back home to that hostile environment and to that Gentile crowd and tell them what Jesus has done in your life. Amen. Oh, they said, you know, when I got saved, they said, well, you know, <laughs> I know Carlton. <laughs> He'll go back to what he used to do. I know Carlton. He'll be using that same deplorable language he used to use. Yeah, he'll drink the same beverages that he used to drink. He'll act the same way. Well, here it is. That happened on the 2nd of February, 1975. That's been a few years ago, hasn't it? And I haven't gone back. And I'm not going back. Because there's nothing to go back to. There's only something to go to. And that's to be in the presence of God and live for Him. I'm telling you, I'm so glad I'm a Christian. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm glad that I'm part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. The mission is to tell others of the provision of God, the goodness of God, the salvation of the Lord, and the mercy of the Lord. For the greatest picture of mercy is found at an old Roman rugged cross. And last, Jesus brings the results. This man did what Jesus said. He went, are you doing what Jesus has commanded and told you to do? It's simple to serve him, to love him, and to obey him. And declared what great things Jesus had done for him. What happened? The last words of those scriptures says that the people marveled, astonished, a changed life. Oh, I'm glad he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, you know what? I'm astonished of the things that he does and how he does them. As you see, Jesus will return to this place later on as we continue in this study. And the people are being healed, saved, changed, and blessed. And the people said of Jesus, he does all things well. He really does. And he will do all things and all that craziness that's going on in your life that seems like 10,000 butterflies flying around in your brain. Let me tell you, I'll tell you like I told Ezra as I told you last Sunday. You'll never get your brain right until you get your heart right. Jesus is a victorious, transforming Savior. And he does all things well. And he will do all things well in your life. He's stronger than any demon you'll ever face. Just speak the name of Jesus. He is genuinely Lord over all. Jesus is what we need. And Jesus is who we have. He is who you and I need today and every day of our life. If you're lost, 
He offers you mercy, forgiveness, atonement, salvation, and heaven. If you're depressed, he will encourage you. He really will. And if you're burdened, he will carry your burdens if you're willing to cast them upon him. The question is, will you come to Jesus today? Because he has victory for you. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Healing for your soul, healing for your body, healing for your mind, healing in your relationships. Only Jesus can heal your life. Would you bow your heads a moment?